Well, good evening. It's great to be here. Hope you've had a, a, a great week, whatever you've been doing. Um, I'm sorry, it's me again. Um, if you came last week and you were bored stiff and you arrived and you thought, oh no, it's him again, I'm sorry. Um, but if you didn't come last week and you've arrived, I was brilliant last week. I was hilarious, I was funny. Um, just ignore the person next to you that thought I was boring and dull. I will um, um, endeavor to um, keep you all awake. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this evening, we're considering the question, who am I? Who am I? But uh, let's take a look at this and uh, hear from some people on the streets. Oh, no, no, this is um, a little video we put together. Who am I? Am I what I do? Am I an artist, a teacher, a businessman, a father? Or am I what I've achieved? An honor student, an MVP, a winner? Am I defined by guilt, resentment, anger, or fear? Or do material things define me? Am I the things I've done right, or am I defined by the things I've done wrong? Am I a saint, or a sinner? What about what others think of me? Am I kind, ugly, funny, a success, or a failure? Am I all of these things, or none of these things? How I identify myself determines how I approach life. If I am what I do, then I'll always need to do more, and achieve more to find my value. If I am what others say, I'll always be defined by the expectations of others and constantly strive to please people. What defines me? And if it's all stripped away, what's left? Who am I? So um, there you have it. And if you missed um, last week, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a recap from last week. Last week on Alpha, we considered the question, um, what on earth am I here for? What on earth am I here for? And we considered three different approaches um, to how we might discover our purpose. And uh, we looked at mystical approach, we looked at the philosophical approach, we looked at the the self-help approach. And um, this evening, we're kind of carrying on that journey of purpose and identity. Um, and you'll remember if you were here last, last week, I, I commented and said that um, really we can only discover um, what our purpose is in relation to the one who created us. And in m- many ways, that's what we're going to continue to consider um, this evening. I also said that last week that there are three basic needs common to humanity. Firstly, that we want to be significant. Secondly, that we want to be secure. And thirdly, that we want to be loved. We want to be loved for not just our public self, but for our private self, the, 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 the person in the shadows that often no one really knows and no one knows our thoughts and our ideas. You may have agreed or disagreed with some of my conclusions from last week, and that's fine. Well, this evening we're going to consider the question, as we've just seen, who am I? As we consider other supplementary questions like, do I matter? Does my life matter? Does your life matter? Last week, you may remember, um, I gave um, um, the Christian claim that God created humanity because he loves us. God created you because he loves you. God created me because he loves loves me. And in the Bible, in one of the books of the Old Testament, we read this, where God says, I am your creator, you were in my care even before you were born. I am your creator. You were in my care even before you were born. And from a Christian point of view, Christians would say that that you are not an accident. I am not an accident. Your birth was no mistake or mishap, and your life is no fluke or of, of nature. It's not some kind of like random thing that just happened to happen. Your life has significance. You know, it might be that for some of us, um, our parents hadn't planned to have us, but God planned us. God planned us, and as we looked last week, since the very foundations of the earth, before the foundations of the earth, long before, long before your parents conceived you, even in their minds, God conceived you in his mind. He thought of you first, and it's not fate, it's not chance, Um, nor luck. It's not a coincidence that you are here this evening and you are breathing at this very moment. You're alive because God wanted you. He wanted to create you so that he could demonstrate his love for each and every one of us. Furthermore, 
God has prescribed every single part of our body in detail. Um, I'm, you may have, uh, I may have said last week, but um, my wife Zoe and I were expecting our first child um, in the next couple of weeks. And um, one of the things that um, I've become a little bit kind of like compulsive obsesses about is a little app that you can buy um, on the baby center, um, which is all about child development. And from, from the different weeks of development, you can see the child's development and how um, the, the baby forms hairs in the womb, and then those hairs disappear and form the fingerprints and the, and the skin, and it all kind of comes together. It's just incredible. I think you've got to be a mad person, actually, to believe not in the existence of God when you think of how humanity is formed in the womb um, of a mother. It's incredible. You were formed. You were planned by God. One of the um, writers in the Bible, in the, the middle of the book, uh, um, in, the, in a book called the Psalms, writes this, you know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made, bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. God made you for a reason. God made me for a reason. He also decided when we would be born and also when we would die. He planned the days of our life in advance, choosing the exact time of our birth and our death. Again, in the Bible, we read this, you saw me before I was born. God saw you before you were born, and you scheduled every day of my life before I began to breathe. Every day was recorded in your book. Every step, you know, parents know about child development as they see their child, a little kind of, you know, baby on the floor doing nothing apart from pooping, and then all of a sudden starts to to, to get up and move and, and stand up and toddle around and get older and go to university and, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's a little bit in between, obviously. But, I, but as much as a parent sees a child's development, God sees that child's development as well. God has seen your development. God has seen your life up until this moment. And he sees not just from the outside, but also from the inside. Regardless of the circumstances of your birth, God planned you. Because God never does anything by accident. God never makes mistakes. And there are some children who grow up into adulthood and feeling that, that, that they have been a mistake. Perhaps they were unplanned by their parents. Well, God doesn't make mistakes. And so even though some parents may have unplanned a child, God always planned that child. The Christian claim is that God is not haphazard. He doesn't just kind of like throw it all together and see how it's all going to fall. God actually planned the whole of creation and the whole of humanity. He's planned it with incredible precision. The more physicists and biologists and other scientists learn about the universe, the better we understand how it's uniquely suited to human existence, custom made for human life. So in contrast to some of the teaching in GCSE humanities that propagates a random big bang theory to the whole of the universe, you know, this cosmic explosion that just randomly appeared and then all of a sudden, ooh, amoebas and humans and all that kind of stuff. You know, most scientists would argue that there is design in the universe. And there's incredible precision to how things have been created and made. Dr. Michael Denton, who's the Senior Research Fellow in Human Molecular Genetics at the University of Otago in New Zealand, said this in his book, Nature's Destiny. You can buy it on Amazon. It was only published um, uh, 14 years ago. He said this, all evidence, all evidence available in the biological sciences supports the core proposition that the cosmos Everything, all of the universe, planets, stars, Milky Ways, all that kind of stuff, you, me, the cosmos is specifically and specially designed, it's a specially designed whole with life and mankind, life and mankind as its fundamental goal and purpose. A whole in which all facets of reality have their meaning and explanation in this central fact. The Bible said something 
similar a few thousand years earlier when we read this. The Lord created the heavens. God formed the earth and he made it. He set it up. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. God purposed and planned for all of creation to be how it was right from the very beginning. I suppose a question might be is, um, have we screwed it up? It's a good question. My point is this. When we consider the question, who am I? The Christian claim is that you and I were uniquely created by a God who made the whole universe as a home, as a place for us to inhabit in relationship with him. As such, you are not an accident. I'm not an accident. The product of a big bang or a mistake, but you have purpose and meaning. You have value and significance to the very person who created you right at the very beginning. And we can only know who we are in relationship to the one whose we are. But of course, the beginning of our lives doesn't always dictate how we view ourselves throughout our life. There are many things in life that, um, that shape our view of ourselves. I wonder what you think of yourself. I wonder what you might think of me. I wonder what you might think of um, your family. Um, an important question to ask ourselves is what are the kinds of things that define who we are? What are the things that define you as a person? What are the things that have defined your identity? What are the influences in your life that affect the way that you view yourself? Could it be, as we heard in the, that beginning clip that we just watched, that sometimes we view ourselves by what we do, the jobs that we hold or the position that we have? Is it by what we appear to have achieved, whether we've got a degree or not, whether we've got an MA or a, or a Master's of Science or whatever it is? Could it be that, it, that it's those things that define us as a human being? Could it be that we, we've defined ourselves by the things we do right? but also by some of the things that perhaps we've done wrong and that we're ashamed of or we're embarrassed about. And it's those things that create the kind of person that we see um, as we look in the mirror. You know, is it the drive for perfection that forms our identity? What others think about us? The question of identity, who am I, is critical to our lives because it affects both how we view ourselves, our view of our own self, and how we live our lives in relation to the things that we do and the other people that we encounter in life. For example, if you, for whatever reason, have grown up in an environment where perhaps you've um, been told that um, you're, not, you're not attractive, Perhaps you've been told that you, you're an ugly baby and you believe that to be true. You're, mo you're quite likely, if, if that was seed was sown in your mind and in your head, that you will go through life thinking, well, I'm just ugly. I'm just ugly. And everyone else sees me as ugly and that's who I am. I'm just ugly. Whereas God, who the creator of the whole universe, when he created you, saw you and thought you were the most stunning and beautiful person, unique person that he'd met that day, that second, that nanosecond, that moment, because you are. So in the time that's left, I just want to touch briefly on five things that often are common to many of us that often define how we view ourselves, things that define how we see ourselves. The first one is that many of us can be defined by guilt. We might be defined by guilt. We spend our entire lives perhaps running from some of the regrets of things that we've done or things that we've done to other people or perhaps even things we've done to ourselves. For some, it might be shame. I'm defined by you know, some horrible thing that I did to someone or I did to myself. Guilt-driven people are manipulated by their memories. They're driven by the thing that they can remember that they did and that, that they're embarrassed about or ashamed of. They allow their past to control their present, but also to control the shape of their future. 
they often unconsciously punish themselves by sabotaging their own success. We are products, as we are today, of our past. But we don't necessarily have to be prisoners of our past. We don't have to be prisoners of our past. The Christian claim is that who we are in relation to God and therefore our meaning in life is not limited by our past. So if you are here this evening and there are things that you're ashamed of or feel guilty about, the Christian truth is that God wipes that out. He wipes that away. He wipes it away so much that it's unrecognizable. It cannot be identified. It's no longer there. It's taken away. The Bible is full of people whose lives are messed up. The Bible is full of people who are murderers, who are adulterers. You know, um, um, you know he's turned um, Moses, who was a murderer. If you've ever, if you've ever seen um, the Prince of Egypt, the cartoon about the story of, of Egypt being, um, or if you've seen, who's, who's the other guy? Uh, come on. No. No, come on. Noah. Noah. You know, he was... Russell Crowe, that's who I was thinking of. <laughs> no, I wasn't thinking of him. I was thinking of kings and of Exodus. No, it doesn't matter. But David, he was a bad guy as well. He was in the Bible, and he was described as a man after God's own heart in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, he was an adulterer. He was a murderer. He was probably ashamed of the things that he'd done. But those things with God didn't dictate his future. Because God is a God who's in the business of change and transformation. And God specializes in giving people a fresh start, a new start, a new day. And the Bible teaches that forgiveness of the past, things that we've done wrong, not only to other people, but to ourselves, can be wiped away. The slate is wiped clean so that there's a new beginning. So our identity no longer has to be defined by some of the guilt of the past, is the Christian claim. One of the, um, the other th defining things that can often define us as human beings is resentment and anger. You know, broken marriages, you know, key, significant, important relationships in our lives that fail or they, they, um, they fall apart, you know, can lead to quite a lot of anger towards the other person. And we can live with that anger and that anger then goes into our other relationships and we pass it on and we then can have a, have a tendency perhaps to get into a cycle of relationships that fail or we self-sabotage those relationships. And that's part of my own little story that, that um, I was... Um, I was um, um, married previously and my wife had an affair and, um, and because I was so kind of like hurt by that I then got into a cycle of self-sabotaging future relationships because I thought I was going to get hurt by the next person and then the next person so I, I'd end the relationship before I got hurt thankfully God is in the business of restoration and our past not dictating our future and, the, and that, that hurt and that pain or that anger that I felt God was able to take away over a period of time. Sometimes with God, it's like instantaneous. Sometimes it's uh, over a period of time. But resentment not only can, or anger can not only hurt um, ourselves, but it does hurt the people often that are so dear to us. I don't know if you've ever, you know, hurt someone that you deeply love. You never intended to to hurt the person that you deeply love but it, somehow it just kind of came up and, and it was a mistake and, you, and it messed up and, and it damaged the relationship was it, if we carry that kind of stuff it can define our present relationships the truth is that those who've hurt you in the past cannot continue to hurt you unless you hold on to the pain and keep that resentment and the Christian claim is that we can let that pain and that hurt and that anger that has defined us as a person, we can let it go. We can let it go and we can leave it with God who created us and can hold all those things together. I guess he can. He's the creator of the universe. One of the other things that can define us as human beings and our identity and we live with it and we kind of live with other people with it is fear. 
You know, fears can come from trauma, uh, traumatic experiences, unrealistic expectations, growing up in a highly controlled environment at home, or even a genetic um, disposition. Regardless of the, of the cause of the fear, fear-driven people often miss great opportunities in life because they're afraid to venture out, to take another risk. Instead, they play it safe, avoiding risks and trying to maintain perhaps the status quo, never wanting to live and to, and to take a risk. Again, Christianity believes that fear is a self-imposed prison that will keep us from becoming all that God intends us to be. And God is in the business of wiping out fear and bringing freedom so that we can be known for our true selves. One of the verses in the Bible, which I love in the New Testament, says this, well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment is one not yet fully formed in love. Well-formed love banishes, gets rid of fear. One of the other things that can define us as human beings and define our identity, fourthly, is materialism. Materialism, the desire to acquire things so that we will be happier, so that we think that um, life is more fulfilled with the accumulation of belongings, of house, bigger house, bigger car, faster car, whatever it is, black car, who knows, blue car, you know, and that need for always wanting more and thinking that the more we have, the more satisfied we will become. People who are defined by materialism live on the misconception that having more will make them more happy, will make them more important, and will make them more secure. The truth is that possessions only ever provide temporary happiness. It's not that possessions don't provide happiness, but they only provide a temporary happiness because things do not change. Things do not change. We eventually become bored with them and then we want a newer one, a bigger, better version. I wonder which version or how many iPhones you've had. And I wonder how many times you've changed your iPhone, not because there was anything wrong with the other iPhone that you had. You just wanted the newer, bigger, plus, better version. We think that that will make us more happy. Well, thank you very much, Steve Jobs. It's a myth to think that if I get more, I will become more important. Self-worth and net worth are not the same. Your value is not determined by your valuables. And God says that the most valuable things in life are not things. The most valuable things in life are not things. Feel free to disagree with me in your group discussion. The most common myth about money is that having more will make us more secure. It won't. Wealth can be lost instantaneously. We've seen that happen in the last kind of six, seven years with the banking crisis with the breakdown of the banking world. Real security can not only be, be found in something that can never be lost, something that can never be taken away, a relationship with God. Finally, there are some people whose identity is defined by their need for approval. People are defined by their need to, be, to know that they're loved or they're liked by other people. They allow the expectations of parents or wives or husbands or children or teachers or friends to control their lives. I wonder how many things you do just to please your mum. How many things you do just to please your father. Just because you know it will improve your relationship with them. And so we, we get on a cycle and we do more and more and more. And it becomes a perpetual cycle. It's not that pleasing our parent is a bad thing. But if it becomes a perpetual cycle, that means that we, we can't do anything because we know it will upset mum or dad. 
then we've got to perhaps ask our questions, what are the motives? You know, some people are defined by, their, by peer pressure, always worried about, you know, what will others think of them? Unfortunately, those who follow the crowd usually get lost in it. I don't know all the keys to success, but one key failure is to try to please everyone. You cannot please everyone. You cannot live your life pleasing everyone. And if you try, you'll kill yourself. Being controlled by the opinions of others is a guaranteed way. It's a guaranteed way of us losing our own identity, which we can only truly find in a relationship with God. Because no one, the Bible says, can serve two masters. You know, of course, there are all kinds of other forces that can define us as human beings. That's just a little bit of a, a taster, I suppose. But they all lead, I think, to a dead end. Unused potential, unnecessary stress, and an unfilled life. You were made for meaningful relationship. And God's intention for you and your life is not like the fruit fly. 24 hours, and that's it. God has a purpose and a plan for your life that is not just three score years and ten, but a life in relationship with him for eternity. So, as I come into land, here's the Christian view. Christians believe that we're all made in the image and the likeness of God, and that we are supposed to be his representatives in the world, to be like God in the world. The Christian claim is that human beings can only truly find their, their identity in no other place than a relationship with God. We can pursue personal goals and ambitions and purpose and life is important. You remember I was saying that last week, a, you know, a life without purpose is pointless. But if that's all we do, we'll never adequately, it will never adequately define us. Uh, no human activity will ever define us. Even intimate human relationships can't, can't fully Ident, um, identify us. We were created to enjoy a greater dimension of relationship, a, great, a greater dimension of relationship that no human being can satisfy. As St. Augustine put it in the fifth century, he said this, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. In order to fully know ourselves, we need to be filled with the ultimate expression of love that comes from beyond, from outside ourselves. You know, Christianity maintains that we were loved into being. We were, our beings came about through God's divine love. All human love is conditional. You know, people love you perhaps because of personal attributes that are personal to you, connections they have with you, or maybe the, the way um, you know, you, your particular pheromones make them feel. True unconditional love, that's unconditional love, exists without reference to any attribute to the loved person. Christianity maintains that God loves us not because of performance, but because of who he is. And the Bible teaches that God is love. We can't make God love us anymore. And we can't make God love us any less. God loves us because he loves us because he loves us because he loves us. And Christianity contends that we can only get to know God in a personal relationship if we consider his son, Jesus. And over the next couple of weeks on Alpha, we're going to look at that. And I want to encourage you to um, explore historically um, some of the writings about the person of Jesus and consider them for yourself. But just very briefly, as I finish, let's consider briefly Jesus. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another village where he worked as a carpenter until around the age of 30. For three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He'd go around speaking about good news. He did none of the things that we would normally associate with greatness. He was 33 when the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends ran away and left him when the pressure was on. He was nailed between two criminals, and while he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had left on earth. 20 centuries 
have come and gone since then, over 2,000 years. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings and queens that have ever reigned have not affected our life as much as that one ordinary life in the person of Jesus. When Jesus came to earth, he was treated as a stranger. He was born in a little kind of stable, a food trough for animals. That's the Christmas story. He spent most of his time with those whom the world had sort of separated them from, those who were poor, those who were marginalized, the forgotten. He was so irreligious that the religious leaders of the day couldn't recognize him. He taught like no one had ever taught. And his teachings are still taught today because they're so significant. This is the essence of Jesus' teaching in the Bible, that love is vital to the formation of our identity. And that it's not our imperfect attempts to give and receive love that matter, but so much as God's unconditional love for all of us. God's unconditional love that can wipe away all the inaccurate things that can often define us as human beings. And next week, we're going to look at some of the historical evidence for the life of Jesus and the claim that he was the Son of God. Because if that isn't true, if Jesus never existed, and if um, his claims to be the Son of God are untrue, the whole foundation of Christianity has to be called into question. And people like me should just pack up their bags and get a different job. We'll also going to be asking the question why a man who overthrow money lenders and tables in the temple hung out with some of the most dangerous and disenfranchised people and has since moved the hearts of millions worldwide I don't know what your picture or your image of Jesus might be maybe you've got a an image of Jesus as some light fluffy kind of person who hovers above the ground perhaps a little bit like this person here. I am walking in the dirt. Hey, Peter, Peter. I am walking in the dirt and the rocks and the, huh? There's Jesus. Huh? Jesus isn't a rock. Hey, Andrew. Oh, man. Andrew is my friend. Andrew. This way. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Hey, Jesus. Hello, my son. Have a seat. Hey, Jesus. I was just sitting here with my stick, enjoying the sun shine. Jesus, I thought we were playing hide and seek and you weren't hiding. No, Peter, I wasn't playing hide-and-seek. I only told you that, so you would leave me alone. You see, I'm Jesus. I'm an important guy. I have important things, heavenly things to think about. You're always bothering me with your problems, and this guy's talking about what he wants for Christmas, and... But Jesus, I thought you were our friend. I am your friend. I just don't have time for you. Oh, man. <laughs> Love that little clip, and there's more of that to come um, next week. So, um, we're not going to consider Jesus tonight, but I want to encourage you in your groups, consider what I've been talking about this evening, perhaps those things that might define us as human beings. Maybe some of them rang true for you, maybe some of them didn't. Feel free to ask questions of your group leaders and your group helpers. We're going to break for coffee, and then uh, be back for a group discussion in five minutes, okay? Thank you.